Let's go, girls. Come on. From New York City to Los Angeles, Powered Up with Beck and Franklin is giving women of all ages permission to live the life they've always dreamed of. Why live in black and white when you can choose the brilliance of 3D and Technicolor? Each week, Sandra Beck and Linda Franklin and their high-powered guests will be here to cheer you on, to share their challenges, their successes, and what they've learned along the way. It's all about women supporting women. The stories and practical tips on sex, beauty, money, and so much more are designed to help you reconnect to the powerful woman you are. Fabulous knows no limits. Now it's time for you to expand your boundaries. Here are Sandra Beck and Linda Franklin. Hey, ladies, this is Sandra Beck, and Linda Franklin has the week off. We are interviewing today a wonderful author who wrote a book called Brave Girls, which, for those of you who are regular listeners, know that that's right up our alley. Uh, we're going to be visiting today with Dr. Stacy Radin, and she has written a book about raising young women with passion and purpose to become powerful leaders. Boy, Stacy, you're in the right place this week. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> It's, you know, we talk every week about women's issues, you know, anything from education to finances to sexuality. And one of the things that I was really excited about to talk to you today is about leadership and powerful leadership, because I'm on another radio show, Military Mom Talk Radio, where we talk a lot about leadership. And my coach talk radio show, we talk about business leadership. But it's an interesting concept to raise young women to become powerful leaders. And, you know, before we get into the powerful leadership uh, part, I'd love you to introduce yourself to our listeners um, so that they know who they're listening to. Yes, so I'm Stacy Radin. I'm the founder of Unleashed, which is a social justice program empowering young women to be social activists and stand up for what they believe in and fight and advocate for a cause that they are so passionate about. And secondly, obviously, the author of Brave Girls and a leadership consultant for women executives in corporate America. Now, Stacy, one of the things that I found, you know, with respect to my military background over the years is that leadership is defined in a lot of different ways and leadership means different things to different people, especially to women sometimes where I see these wonderful, you know, female leaders or wonderful women leaders that, you know, are criticized or castigated either between, you know, they're too much like their male counterparts or they, you know, they're, they're leading with a feminine edge. And, you know, to me, leadership is leadership. You can empower Mm -hmm. people to follow you, believe in you. That's my opinion. Can you define mm -hmm. leadership for us for the purposes of our discussion today? Yeah. So I agree with you with about everything that you just said. And that is one of the biggest things is when I see all these how-to books, I cringe a little bit because it isn't about following someone else's script. And it isn't about, you know, you, you see these great leaders like Sheryl Sandberg and, and um, write a book about leadership, but that that's her style of leadership. And so the purpose is not to create, you know, mini-me's and mini Cheryls all over the world, but it is about finding your own what I call leadership style, leadership core. So for purposes of how I use the term is that from my perspective um, that it is, you know, it is basically – threefold. Um, so a powerful leader in my, in, from my definition is kind of this integrated model where it is about who you are. And that's, that's why as a clinical psychologist, I went into the leadership development world because I felt at the core, it is about what your values are as a leader, how, uh, how empathic you are to the team that you're leading, how attuned you are into their needs? Are you developing other people and getting outside yourself? Are you using your strengths? Do you know what your strengths are, your value proposition? Are you leveraging that, those things and then surrounding yourself with people who have different expertise than you? You don't want, you know, on a team the same, the same person that you are, um, but you have to be confident in your own self to be able to do that. But then also, 
you know, how you communicate, so relational power. How do you communicate? How do you engage? How do you inspire other people? And how, again, using that attunement to each and every individual um, to make that happen. And then the assertive power piece, which is taking action and, and feeling confident enough in yourself that you can stand up for what you believe in, even if you're the lone voice in the room, willing to take a risk and fall down and get back up and be resilient and project plan and do what you do best in the world. So all of those things, from my perspective, it has to be an integrated, all those integrated components to, to, to be a really powerful leader. Well, and I like that. You know, I went to Northwestern. I got a master's uh, degree from there. And, you know, that was in the late 80s, early 90s, where we were just coming off the, you know, kind of women corporate leadership where you had to cut your hair short, you know, wear a blue Mm -hmm. suit, wear like a little mini girl tie. That's what I used to call them. Like, I'm wearing a girl tie. Um, You know, and then we kind of slingshotted towards, you know, kind of like I saw like a very hyper sexy female leadership where it was like, okay, you know, we're the the cat woman and we're going to come out and we're going to be ballistic, you know, and I've watched, you know, over the years as, you know, women have kind of gone through these different generations of what is leadership from like male leadership to female Mm -hmm. leadership, which always made me laugh, Stacey, because, you know, I was raised with brothers and leadership is leadership. I don't care any way you slice it. And Mm -hmm. I love what you said about, you know, taking your personal strengths, because one of the things I want to talk about is like, especially with some female leaders, um, is that people will always mistake my kindness for weakness, you know, Mm -hmm. as a leader, kindness from a man is, is considered sometimes almost effeminate and kindness from a woman is seen as weakness by a lot Mm -hmm. of people. And um, I agree. (laughs) I would love to get your thoughts on that. So it's an interesting concept because I spent 10 years of working with women in corporate America, and I still do um, when I have the time. And I researched my research, which was the foundation of the book and the Unleashed program, was speaking to 200 women in powerful positions and tracing them back to their earliest moments of feeling powerful and their challenges and kind of their experiences. And I have to say, you just talked about a lot of the things that they talk about, or when I'm coaching women, they will talk about it is a tight rope that you walk at all times of not wanting to go too far over into being really feminine because if you display feminine characteristics, women are so afraid that that will be seen as a weakness and a handicap. Um, and then the flip side of that is not to be too aggressive Um, because, and you start acting like a a man and you start, you know, because you're in a culture, especially within male-dominated fields, and you're trying to be what you see. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of, you know, positive female role role models in, in, you know, at that level. So they start to try to emulate what their role models are, you know, just like girls do and just like kids do. As, you know, we grow up, we were looking for those mentors. Unfortunately, they're all men, so they feel that they have to, replicate exactly how a man acts. Unfortunately, um, when they do act that way, I think they feel inauthentic because I think they're donning this veneer that they're trying to convince themselves and other people that they're just as strong and capable of a man and acting like a man. And at the same time, it's not believable because it's not authentic. So that's why I have tried so much to coach women, to think about who you are. Forget about the milieu that you're surrounded by. You know, we can work on, you know, fitting in and assimilating into a culture, but start with who you are. And if you are veering from that in any way, you really need to stop and think about why and the impact that it is having because people will notice it. Well, I'm going to pose a difficult question that I know I've been stumped by, so I don't mean to put you on the spot, and I'm sure you have a great answer for it. But asking a woman to figure out who she is Mm -hmm. (laughs) is really 
difficult because, you know, if you ask me who I am as a radio show host, I'm like, okay, I'm this person. If you ask me who I am right. as a technology company owner, which is what I, you know, what I, how I make my money and how I generate things. But then if you ask me like as a girlfriend or as a mother of two, a single mother, you know, these different roles that we, we wear require like different leadership capabilities. And it's, mm-hmm. you know, funny because becoming a mother, I have an eight and 11 year old has really helped me with my, my military work because I understand boys. I have got two boys. I understand the 19 year old mentality. I can get the best out of them, which is something that I struggled with, you know, years ago, but you know, our different roles make it really hard to define who we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I say who you are, I think again, just to kind of define that is going back to the core of who, you know, the core like literally trying to drill down in terms of what your values are, what's important for you. And that could be, you know, sometimes I'll give even the girls a sheet of all these different various things like integrity or education, money, because that's, you know, it's okay to feel that that's your driving force. But just to start thinking about what is really, truly important to you and having them drill down to three or four, maybe five um, things that do you do think define everything that you do at the end and I truly believe those values is how you show up in the world no matter what context you are in like whatever that work life personal community is all integrated and so that is one of the things I've seen remarkably is that people will say when they start to think about these things and what's important to them and what their strengths are because usually what your strengths are you're typically good at Um, and so thinking about opportunities that enhance those you know those positive strengths of yours and and leading with those so I'm very strength-based type person is you'll see that who you are will show up as a mother, as a um, a friend, a sister, a you know working in the PTA, volunteer, and and your business world if you're aligned with those values. Um, and that's where I like to start to to get women to start to articulate what your values are and what your strengths are. And are those strengths being utilized in the way that you want them to be utilized? Are you also, are you, like what you said, are you taking off one mask and jumping into another role and you don't feel aligned? You don't feel like you're being the person you are in another area. Um, Stacy, I, I got to cut that. you off or go into commercial break. Uh, this is Powered Up Talk Radio. We're visiting today with the author of Brave Girls, Dr. Stacy Raiden. When we come back, we're going to talk more about finding out who we are at our core, as Stacy said, with our values. Um, and we're going to talk more about that when we get back from the break. We've got lots more Powered Up with Sandra Beck and Linda Franklin after these messages. Congratulations on being the proud owner of an adorable, soft, cuddly, sweet-smelling, smiling, cooing, hungry, tired, gassy, screaming little bundle of joy. So now what? Where's the owner's manual for this thing? Where are my instructions? Right here. It's Baby and Toddler Instructions with Blythe Lippman on toginet.com. Infant care specialist Blythe Lippman has worked with babies for over 20 years and works extensively with new parents providing workshops, in-home visits, tips, and daily phone calls to ease those frazzled nerves. With baby and toddler instructions, you can get the advice you need on how to survive and enjoy your baby's first year. For more information on Blythe and how she can help you, go to babyinstructions.com. From 32 ways to stop a baby from crying to 14 ways to get a baby to eat and so much more, it's Baby and Toddler Instructions with Blythe Lipman on toginet.com. If you're ready for a big change in your work, your career, your happiness, your life, it's time for the Million Dollar Mindset with Marla Tabaka. Monday afternoons at 2, 1 central on toginet.com. Marla believes that with the right mindset, anything is possible. Join us as successful life coach Marla Tabaka inspires you and her clients to explore, 
Discover and live your dreams by developing what she calls the Million Dollar Mindset. Marla will inspire you to take action on your dreams and reveal secrets to success that will help you realize your own unique power. Tune into the Million Dollar Mindset for heartwarming stories with Marla Tabaka. Learn tips and tricks to building a successful business and unlock the secrets to creating a happier, more balanced life through abundant thinking and attraction power. For more information on the Million Dollar Mindset, go to our website, MarlaTabaka.com. That's M-A-R-L-A-T-A-B-A-K-A.com. It's the Million Dollar Mindset with Marla Tabaka. Monday afternoons at 2, 1 p.m. Central on Toginet.com. We're back with Sandra Beck and Linda Franklin. Here's more Powered Up with Beck and Franklin. Hey, ladies, this is Sandra Beck, and Linda Franklin has the week off. We are visiting today with author Stacey Radin. She is the author of Brave Girls, Raising Young Women with Passion and Purpose to Become Powerful Leaders. Now, Stacey, I know your book talks about the formation stages in girls' development with respect to their self-identification. And I'm curious because, you know, it's accepted that, you know, um, I think, and you said it in your in the promo materials that you know successful leaders learn to, how to do so in the middle grades. Um, for somebody like me, I was a late bloomer. I don't think I got it until I was like twenty, <laughs> mm-hmm. and you know, I was you know in the middle grades. I'll be honest, I was really dorky. I was really shy. I was really. I don't think I said two words to anybody in the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Um, and it was only when I went, uh, and I'll say when I went to Northwestern at at eighteen that I really found my groove in the world. And I didn't find my voice till I was probably twenty one or twenty two. So. I want to talk about how we develop and how we change. Like, you know, you were talking about values and and core beliefs and things like that. And, you know, I was making some notes during the break about like what I was like in my twenties, forties, and, you know, I haven't gotten to my sixties yet, but, you know, I'd love to know from a standpoint of, of your experience, how do we grow as women leaders? Like for me, I don't think Mm -hmm. I got it till I was in my twenties. Yeah. Yeah, and just to, you know, think about it, the reason I um, decided to create an experience for girls in adolescence is because most girls are similar to what you've just described. In fact, the women that follow us or are our biggest fans or when I'm speaking out in the world will say, I wish I had unleashed when I was a, when I was that age or a program like it. So my theory was that if I cultivated the tools that girls will need, you know, kind of looking backwards, as I, you know, I as mentioned, I talked to those women leaders and brought them back to the earliest moments they had, knowing, and with my dissertation was on adolescent female identity, knowing that that was such a critical age because they were thinking about who they were anyway um, and trying to find themselves, and it was the beginning of where they're like everything that they knew is just thrown out the window, and they throw their family values out the window because they think that they want to rebel against them, but it's a right time. So Unleashed was my hypothesis that if we started it then, that it would cultivate and grow. But again, cultivate and grow just like a plant, you know, just like a flower is that you're, you're going to grow and develop as you deal with different life experiences or you go to college or um, you might have a certain challenge that you've overcome, whether it's, you know, uh, physical or a situation like divorce or you lose somebody that's important to you. I mean, everything in life does change you. Um, it changes your perspective just by by having that experience. I think the biggest thing is is being open to explore, how, you know, at different moments in your life is to take stock and say, where am I now? And also, where did I come from? You know, where was I, you know, 10 years ago? Where was I 20 years ago? Um, so that you can see that trajectory of growth. Um, and that's what the women I interviewed were able to do with me, as they said, I never saw the pattern of how I got to where I am now because I'm always looking forward um, and not backwards and seeing it. There was critical moments in my career. There was critical moments in my life that shaped me and that brought me to a different level of awareness in that I had to create change 
or I had to do things differently because of that moment. Well, you know, and I think you're you're spot on with this because, you know, you're right. It's like as most most leaders are visionaries and, and, you know, we look forward. And, you know, while you were talking, I was thinking to something you said about, you know, like things like divorce that change us. Um, you know, when I got divorced and became a single parent, my kids were, you know, three months old and two years old. And, you know, it was like, oh, no, <laughs> what do we right. do now? Um, but what kicked in, you know, interestingly enough, what kicked in was some of my survival mechanisms that I used in junior high and high school. And then, you know, what pushed me to get through Northwestern and get my master's degree, you know, by the time I was 21, you're right. There's these things you don't really think about, like what propelled you. And I look at all my, you know, past military experience that helped me like go, okay, you got to take charge of the situation. You got to have a plan. You got to figure this out. You got to, you know, there was no time for me to go, boo hoo hoo in my soup I Mm -hmm. had bills to pay and kids to raise and you know I didn't even think about like you know you look at like you know I played soccer and I swam you know I swam for like 15 years and you know my coach would be like look you can't sit there and cry so what you lost you know you get in the pool Mm -hmm. and you swim another you know I never even thought about how all those things prepared me for whatever life's next challenge is is that Mm -hmm. what you're talking about like a life yeah exactly Mm -hmm. You kind of gather, and this is what, it's funny because when I coach younger women, and when I mean younger women, I'm not talking about my middle school and high school girls, I'm talking about, you know, mid-20s also, and and when I'm coaching them, it's very hard for them to see that a career is a trajectory. They're they're like, but I don't know what I want to do, you know, and they're looking way out, and I say to them all the time is, forget about the way out vision, we'll go back there, but every experience that you have in your career leads to another um, another step. And women don't do, typically don't do that linear uh, career uh, path that a man does. We don't, we don't do A to B. We typically will zigzag. We might go backwards. We might take a parallel role. We might not feel so passionate about what we do anymore, and we're willing to jump off and try something different. But all of the things that we're learning, we're kind of, it's like you have a basket, and you're taking some pieces of we're experiencing, and you're gathering it in your basket. And then, you know, when you're older and you're moving forward, you will look back and say, I can now see how all these different, the pattern, I can see how all of those different um, experiences, positive and negative, by the way, shape me. And I took what I liked from that job, and then I moved to another job because I wanted X amount of experience, and I was interested in that. And then I took X again from that job, and I went forward um, to another job that might not – people might have thought that they were crazy, and that's what the women that I interviewed said is that people thought that I was a lunatic, that I was giving up this high-powered job to go move to Atlanta in – you know, in a small office, well, lo and behold, I became a big fish in a small office, and then I ended up being CFO of, like, billions of dollars, a company worth billions of dollars because I was willing to take that risk. Uh, men are, mo- are much more calculated about those types of risks because they feel like they're going to lose it all, where women, I think, are open to doing that because they don't think that there's any other way but to take those types of risks. Well, and I love the words you're choosing because, you know, in my career path, I've been called scatterbrained, a slingshot. You know, I taught at USC. I worked at Disney. I worked at CBS. Then I worked at Coldwell Banker. Then I taught, you know, then I formed my own company. Then I did this, then I did that. And, you know, I termed, I, I coined the term for myself, and I'm sure somebody else has used it, but I had careerlets. I had these little yeah. mini careers, and I would try them on, you know, like a pair of shoes for, you know, maybe a year and a half, two years, sometimes three years or longer. But the whole point was that, you know, I did take like when it didn't work for me anymore, it was time for me to move on. And now I thought that was the right path for me. But the value judgment placed on Mm -hmm. that, you know, especially I come from a household of engineers and scientists, you know, who are very systematic and, you know, and they were like, oh, my God, what career is she in now? Um, You know, and that was the right path for me. And I, you know, 
I think it was in, integral to my success because whenever I outgrew a job or didn't feel like I, my heart was in it anymore, and it wasn't even a question of, you know, like you said, it was about taking risk. To me, it wasn't even a risk. It was like, oh, God, I can't do this anymore. This is not what I want to do. And I would make those changes. But it, the word risk never came into my vocabulary. Is that typically women? Well, I'm calling it a risk because as an outsider, it is a risk, you know, and so you should applaud yourself that you were able to take those risks and not feel scared or anxious to do so because it is a risk. It could have went really bad. I think women, powerful women anyway, let's just qualify that, are willing to take risks and willing to get out of their comfort zone and willing to make decisions and not care about what other people say or or how other people judge them because they know it's the right thing to do. It's interesting that you just said about the, when you felt you didn't, weren't really engaged or passionate about it, and that's what I found in my research also. When powerful women are not engaged anymore, they need to get off and do something different. They can't smile and go to work. They, don't, they need to feel attached and passionate about what they're doing, whether it's, you know, in a coal mine or you know, on the battlefield or a teacher in a classroom, they need to feel that connection or they just, they literally just cannot do it. Well, that's, that's exactly what I'm, what I was trying, you, you articulate things beautifully, by the way. Um, you know, I wish I had had you in my twenties and thirties to explain to like my family and friends what, what was going on. <laughs> because, you know, what you talked about, you know, like that's what I said, well, it didn't feel like risk. It was actually an impossibility for me to move forward once I was done. Like I'm just done. Like there's no emotional, there's no challenge. There's no anything I'm done, done, done. And the thing is there to me, there was no possibility of failure in moving forward because to me failure would have been staying put so even if I Mm -hmm. you know took a new job and it was a bust you know then you just you move on to another one or you move on to a new career if that didn't serve you um but it's so funny because to me there was no risk to me the failure was staying where I was and we have about two minutes so I want to hear your opinion on that Yeah, and I think it's how we define failure, right? And so I personally am not afraid to fail, and we could talk more about failure after the break because it is a big topic. Women sometimes are so afraid to fail that they don't want to take those risks. Um, But failure is the best learning experience that you could ever have. It is a gift, and the most important thing is to evaluate it and to get back up and dust yourself off and put your big girl big girl pants back on (laughs) and get back in in the game because it is so critical to to our learning hey we're going to come back after the break we're here today this is powered up talk radio with sandra beck linda franklin has the day off we're visiting with stacy radin she wrote a wonderful book called brave girls and when we come back from the break we're going to talk about how failure can be fun because i'm really good at failing (laughs) more after the break we've got lots more powered up with Sandra Beck and Linda Franklin after these messages this is for all you girls about 42 tossing Have you ever wondered if you're normal or why you feel distant from your partner? Then join us for Sex Talk with Lou with your host, Lou Paget on TogiNet Wednesday nights, 9, 8 central. Do you want to recreate a truly connected relationship or wonder, how do I tell my kids about things? Join Lou Paget, one of the world's best-selling authors in the field of sexuality, a certified sex educator and sought-after expert for all media and her renowned expert guests as they discuss anything and everything about sex that impacts our lives and our families' lives. For more on Lou, check out her website, loupaget.com. This is the show where the best experts in the field of sexuality and sexual health can finally give you the answer to that question. Join us for Sex Talk with Lou with your host, Lou Paget, Wednesday nights at 9, 8 central on toginet.com. 
Are you looking for something more in your life or business? More success? More stability? More happiness? It's all out there waiting for you, but it doesn't just happen. You've got to go get it. Make it happen with Michelle McCullough, where motivation and strategy intersect. Michelle is a serial entrepreneur, acclaimed speaker, and the WooHoo Radio Network's resident business and success strategist. Michelle has the smart strategies and experience to help you improve your life and take your business to the next level. You've got big dreams. You've got big vision. Now it's time for you to make it happen. We're back with Sandra Beck and Linda Franklin. Here's some more Powered Up with Beck and Franklin. This is for all you girls. Hey, ladies, this is Sandra Beck and Linda Franklin has the day off. We're talking today with author of Brave Girls, Stacey Radin. And uh, if you missed the first half of our show, you're going to want to listen to this. You can pick us up on toginet.com. That's T-O-G-I-N-E-T.com. You can also go to our website, poweredUptalkRadio.com. And our shows over 100 hours of amazing, amazingly great, powerful interviews with, with women and men who change the world, like Stacy, uh, are available on iTunes. All you have to do is go to PoweredUpTalkRadio.com, and we do have a bunch of our broadcasts available on YouTube. So Powered Up Talk Radio is the phrase that you want to type into Google to find this show and more shows like it. Now, before we went to break, I promised you guys that we were going to talk about failure, and I personally am a big fan of failure, Stacy. I mean, I, I'm good at it. You know, I've, I fail forward. I, I try to move forward after my failures. But one of the things that I really like about failure, <laughs> this sounds ridiculous, but is once you've had some epic failures in my life, and my epic failures, you know, are, are pretty epic, um, including my divorce, you know, big, big crash and burn. Um, but you have nowhere to go, but up like, that's Mm -hmm. the thing is like, to me, failure takes the pressure off. It's like, okay, I failed on this one. I've got the failure under my belt. So now I can go and try something new because new things aren't really new. They're just new things for us. So if you've already failed, you know, you can, you can just relax because you failed so funny that you said that because I feel the same way is that I once said to somebody, there was no pressure because there was nowhere else to go but up. And so it wasn't really a risk in my mind either because um, because there was no way that I could go backwards because I had hit rock, rock bottom. So the only thing that I could do was improve upon that. Well, you know, and it's a mindset, you know, if you think all the time about like, oh my God, is this going to work? Is this going to work? As opposed to going, woo, this, this might work. Mm -hmm. And if it didn't work, I already failed yesterday. So big deal. Yeah. And so when I'm working with the middle school girls, it's a very interesting concept. And I think it is because of the stage that they're in. They're so afraid to fail. They're so afraid to like put something out there so that, you know, they're so, their antenna is up for anybody to break it down or that somebody's going to say, that's really stupid. What are you talking about? So they, I can see it. I can physically see when they're kind of step back and, and don't want to move forward. And I will say to them, you know what, girls, the best thing that you can do in this supportive environment is to fail. Like if you're going to fail anywhere, fail with me because this is a really supportive environment. We can look at and debrief what went wrong and what you would do differently, but go ahead, you know, take that risk. And I will always share with them my personal experience that I had done this research that I talked to you about, and I try, and I had an agent, and I had a great proposal, and I didn't got rejected by every single publishing house in in more than I even know, knew at places I never even heard of. Um, over and over and over again, it was so disappointing. I was depressed. I was like, "What did I do wrong?" and Um, This feels really miserable. I never want to do this again. But the research and the the topics that I and the model that I had created were haunting me. Like, you have to do something with this, and so maybe it's not a book. And I developed Unleash because of that failure. So I always say Unleash, if I had been a success at that point, 
I never would have had Unleashed, and that was a life-changing, alter, life-altering experience for me to do Unleashed, and that led to a much better book to look at the dynamics and how it applies to women, but also applies to, you know, a 10- and 12-year-old um, and the core of being female. I would never have gotten that opportunity unless I fell miserably on my face. Well, and see, I'm going to change your languages a little bit, even though you're the PhD and I'm just the idiot radio host, um, <laughs> because, you know, you talk about failing miserably. And I look at that as that to me is a successful failure, like not the so much the part about, you know, it translating into, you know, a new career or a new entity for you, but you got rejected by everybody. Like to me, yep. that's an achievement. Most people, when they fail, they stop. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I used to mm -hmm. um, talk a lot with Steve Shelley, who's an ex-Miami Dolphin. We worked together on a lot of projects, and he worked under Don Shula, um, who was a famous Miami Dolphin coach and great leader. And he would always say to me, Sam, you know, successful people continue when most people won't. Successful people do the things that most people won't. Successful people mm -hmm. keep going when other people quit. You know, that he was always about success, success, and he's got a nice coaching program right now. But we used to talk a lot about a successful failure and a successful failure is when you've exhausted like all ability to succeed. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Cause you didn't give up. You didn't stop. You're not three yep, inches away from striking gold. So when you said you were rejected all over the place, you know, you got rejected yep. by people you didn't even know. I'm exactly. Like, I never heard of this teeny tiny book publishing in, in, in my life, but they still didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But go, Stacy, go. Because there's right. something like to me, there's something magical. There's something amazing. And, you know, when I have a string of failures, you know, because everybody who creates everybody who lives, you know, and breathes, you know, mouth breathers, we have failures. So when mm -hmm. I look at having a lot of failures, I have to like, slap myself upside the head and go, you know, these are successful failures because you're still going, you're still trying, you're still creating. And even though that creative outlet didn't work for you, you kept going until something did. So to me, those are very successful failures. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I have to say is that the problem is that a lot of women and girls will look at successful women and say, I could never be that. They, they put women in, on a pedestal and say, I could never be them because a lot of women are not going around talking about their failures. And I think it's really important for all of us to serve as role models together. It's like, look, I'm not perfect. Nobody can be perfect. Even I, who you think, you know, girls will say, oh, you started this, and oh, you, you're the boss, and all of these crazy wild images they have of that. And they think that I don't make mistakes. In fact, when I do make a mistake with them, and they call me out, I will make a big deal out of it and say, oh, my God, I failed, and look, I'm still standing. Wow. <laughs> you know, and I use comedy a lot. Like, I didn't disintegrate into the world, and, and I'm still standing, and I, I'm not invisible. And they will laugh, but I think they get the point is that we all fail. And there's nobody I know that doesn't, and if they aren't talking about it or they might be hiding from it or not be self-aware about it or not owning it and want to rationalize and become defensive about it. But everybody fails, and it's what you do with that failure or that challenge or that setback. You know, it doesn't have to be a miserable, um, a successful failure. <laughs> it could be just as simple as a setback and, and do you give up? Or do you try to figure out and innovate how to go around those obstacles and those setbacks? And people will say to me all the time, I can't believe in it, when you're talking publicly that you you start off talk sometimes talking about I'm gonna I'm gonna shock you guys. I'm gonna talk to you about something that you probably didn't want didn't expect to hear today is that let's talk about all the things that I did wrong before we talk about all the things that came out of that. But it's really important for people to know that successful people fail. I mean, look at the most successful entrepreneurs, I think, fail five or six times before they hit something big. Um, well, and failure is a great icebreaker. You know, failure is a great, it breaks down barriers. Talking about your failures, you know, they allow people to see you as a human being, to like you and learn from you rather than, like you said, put yourself on a pedestal. And let's be honest, failures, 
funny. You know what I mean? It's like there is always something funny in failure. You know, I look at, you know, my my radio career came out of my failed divorce, you know, and here I thought I was so smart, got a master's from a top university, look at it, her and she all that big executive job, you know, happened to be dumb as a rock in my personal life. And people are like, you know, didn't you know he was cheating? Didn't you know he was with this person? Didn't you know he was with that person? You know, and I could have taken that, gone into the turtle, been completely crushed. And, you know, I thought it was really funny. It's like, you know, what do you, you know, I'm not perfect. How am I supposed to know this stuff? And instead of internalizing it, you know, I started writing a blog, Stacy, and I was going to do this 30 day shape challenge, you know, shape magazine has their 30 day challenges, you know, and here I am, you know, two kids, a company to run. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to lose 30 pounds. Well, I ended up gaining 30 pounds, but <laughs> the whole point was that was what got me in front of the radio people to put me on the air. It's like, you know, failure bonds, failure breaks down communication barriers, failure makes you likable. We don't like movies. Like you think of heroines in movies. We've got to like, we've got to see her fail to really want to root for her. Yep. It's, it's so critical and it's so important. And I think we all should be talking a lot more about it or looking at our setbacks and saying, how did I handle that? Um, And giving ourselves credit for being resilient or thinking about something different, you know, really giving ourselves credit and looking at it as a gift versus, you know, feeling so awful and terrible about what happened. And yes, that does take time because I felt awful and horrible too. And I think it's important to just process the emotions around it first and, and let it go. And we all have our different coping skills. And I remember saying to people who were like, just go, you didn't give up your business. Just go back into your business. I'm like, no, I know I'm not, um, didn't give up my business, but let me, I know myself, let me wallow in this sadness. Right. Let, me, let me just be sad. Cause I really need to just feel it and absorb it before I can move on. It's kind of like a loss. And it I is need a loss to feel and that. it should be grieved. Absolutely. We've got about two minutes uh, to the end of the segment. Stacy. can you talk a little bit about the importance of grieving a failure? Yeah, and it's, it's so synergistic with how we grieve, you know, any other loss. You know, the, the first, the denial of it maybe and minimizing it and trying to rationalize it. You know, you want to just grasp to the whys, like why did this happen? And then moving into that stage of anger and sadness and, you know, but working through all of those things until you start to come to resolution and you've gone through this, you know, kind of this process and and just like loss in any other way is that everybody mourns differently and mourns, you know, some mourn more quickly than others and some, you know, it does take time. But I do think it is about seeing it as a loss whether it is a loss of something that could have been that you thought that you were attached to or a loss of maybe some self-worth and self-value because you think that, you know, you attribute it to if I had this, then I, I was good enough and I didn't, so I'm not. So even if it is just acknowledging that your your perception of yourself went down a little bit, You guys, we're going to come back after the break, and we're going to talk about why we need to get off the why and get to the results as fast as healthy uh, living allows. With uh, this is Sandra Beck, Powered Up Talk Radio, with Stacey Radin of Brave Girls. More after the break. Are you looking for something more in your life or business? More success, more stability, more happiness? It's all out there waiting for you, but it doesn't just happen. You've got to go get it. Make it happen with Michelle McCullough, where motivation and strategy intersect. Michelle is a serial entrepreneur, acclaimed speaker, and the WooHoo Radio Network's resident business and success strategist. Michelle has the smart strategies and experience to help you improve your life and take your business to the next level. You've got big dreams. You've got big vision. Now it's time for you to make it happen. Is there more living for you to do? Yes. Start living inspired. 
Be here for Living Inspired with Trisha Goyer. Thursday afternoons at 4, 3 p.m. Central on toginet.com. Trisha will dig deep into topics that matter most to women, inspiring women to make a change in their own lives and to make a difference in the world, and maybe even deep within their own hearts. Trisha is a wife, mom, speaker, family expert, and author of 24 books. For more information on Trisha and Living Inspired, go to her website, trishagoyer.com. That's T-R-I-C-I-A-G-O-Y-E-R dot com. Trisha's vision is to be the voice of hope and possibility for women of all ages. Her intention is to serve ordinary women by encouraging extraordinary things with God's help. Trisha expresses real life, real hope for real women. Is there more living for you to do? Yes. Start living inspired. Living Inspired with Trisha Goyer. Thursday afternoons at 4, 3 p.m. Central on toginet.com. Sandra Beck and Linda Franklin. Here's more Powered Up with Beck and Franklin. Hi, ladies. This is Sandra Beck of Powered Up Talk Radio. Linda Franklin has the week off. We are visiting today with Stacy Radin, and she wrote a great book called Brave Girls. You're going to want to pick it up. It's wherever booksellers, uh, wherever books are sold. We're going to talk about um, the word why, because you know, Stacy, you had mentioned, you know, when we're talking about grieving our failures, grieving our losses, one of the things that I see is that, and I, I used to do this myself um, until somebody caught me on it, and I'll talk a little bit about who caught me on it, but that women get really mired in the why. We ruminate. We think about it. We think if we're going to figure it out, it's somehow going to change things. And when Oprah was uh, sued or prosecuted or whatever she was by the Texas Cattlemen's Association um, uh, because she said she wasn't eating beef anymore, um, Dr. Phil, before he was Dr. Phil you know, in her television network, said something to her very profound. I watched an interview with them and he said, look, Oprah, because she kept going, why is this happening? Why are they choosing me? Why do they care what I have to say? Why, 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 why? And he's like, look, the why doesn't matter right now. You need to get off the why and get to figuring out what you need to do next. And he talked about how the why changes as new information happens. And when I think of my divorce, I go like, why did he cheat on me? Why did this happen? Mm -hmm. Why? Blah, 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 blah. I probably mm -hmm. wasted a good month at least on the why. And, you know, as I would learn things, as the women would talk to me, as friends would tell me what they knew, you know, after you get a divorce, you get all the dirt. Um, mm -hmm. it, you know, then it was like, oh, now I know the why. And then I learned something mm -hmm. else. Ooh, now I know the why. Well, a lot of times the why really doesn't change anything and it doesn't give you the peace that you think it's going to give you. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't want to say that we shouldn't examine the why because we need to learn from our mistakes. But but getting off the why and getting to what we need to do, like, you know, from a leadership perspective, from a female women's empowerment thing, I know I had trouble getting off the why. Do you ever have trouble getting off the why? Is that typical of the female condition? Yeah, we do. We we always want to – we find that the, if we knew the why, that we could accept it. Right. And I think that we all do. I think when bad things happen, right, you know, whether it's a Sandy Hook or, um, a, you know, a tragedy like 9-11, you know, we start to say because we don't want it to happen again. So we want to get some deeper understanding. And maybe we feel like if we understood some of the why, then we could let it go because it would be rational and logical. But as we all know, we're not, not, not everything is rational and logical, and I have to say probably most things aren't. But we want to put some logic around the why because it's just way too emotionally overwhelming to handle and to cope with. So we try to figure out some things so that it becomes a little bit intellectual and not so emotional. But That's interesting. Yeah, that. because, you know, I was thinking as you were talking about, like, like you know, the, the role of emotions, because, you know, I, I'm raising two boys. I work in primarily, um, you know, between military and technology, I work in a, a male dominated world. And, you know, like, 
here's a perfect example. My girlfriend and her boyfriend break up and you know, I'm on the phone with her for two and a half hours. Like, why did I do this? Why did I choose him? Why did he blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, recently one of the guys who works for me, one of my tech guys, you know, he's like 30 something, you know, broke up with his longtime fiance. And he's like, Hey, Sam, you know, so-and-so and I broke up this weekend. He's like, we're not getting married. And, uh, you know, so that's it. <laughs> You know, and I'm like, it's not that he didn't feel it acutely. You know, I could tell, you know, he was, he was, you know, busted up over this and heartbroken, but he didn't at no point did he question the why? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it was amazing to me that I had these two conversations in the same day, Stacey, both breakups, both, you know, and it wasn't like it was just different personalities. It was just like, I think, you know, there's something in men that allow them to just maybe put it in a box. I don't know. You're the shrink. You can, you can explain it, but, but you know, they just, they don't go down the whole self beat up Y road like we do. They don't, but they also, you know, that doesn't, they don't, they do, they could learn from us as well because what they do go into, because they're such A to B thinkers, I mean, physiologically, that's the way their brain works, and our brain is much more of an emotional kind of systemic brain that thinks about all, we're attuned to everything that's going on in our environment and we want to make sense of it. So there is a physiological, you know, reason for this too on top of socialization, but Men just want to fix a problem. You know, they, they just want to say, okay, what? I, I don't want to hear all the processing stuff. Uh, let's just jump to the to-do. You know, like, what are we going to do? So there is a beauty of kind of men and women pairing to for us to kind of teach them a few things and obviously for, them, for at some point when we're ready to move on to jump to, so what am I going to do about this? Now that I processed it, now that I cried, now that I, you know, threw, you know, a glass against the wall or whatever you do to to get your anger and all your emotions out, you went for a run, whatever. Um, I think there's beauty in, you know, kind of this bilingual, being gender bilingual is sometimes that that something I talk about in the book is that being able to speak each other's language, but also learn and from one another. Oh, I love that. I've taken notes, you know, Stacey, you're going to laugh at me. I'm like A to B thinker, systemic, because I'm going to be like, you know, next time I'm in a, in a meeting and some guy's like, oh, I'll get to the point. You're like, I'm like, okay, A to B thinker. Um, but, you know, you're right. It's like, you know, there's things we can learn, you know, from both genders. And I love that term gender bilingual. That just sounds so smart. <laughs> yeah, no, but it is, It's you know, if you think about it, when you're going to, hopefully, if you're going to travel in a country that doesn't speak the language that you do, you want to get at least have some way to communicate and you get a book, right? Or you take a class if you're going to go to France for six weeks. I'm making that up because I've never done that. But um, And you want to learn basic, you know, ways to communicate. It, it's very similar. You, you know, when you're in somebody else's land, you want to be able to function and learn and enjoy the experience. So you have to... You know, you have to put yourself out there and learn their language, and it's the same. It's, you know, when you are, we are different, and that is something that we've all, you know, science has proved over and over again. We're very, very different, you know, physiologically and physically and mentally and and the way we're socialized. We're different, you know, we're different genders, and um, unless we start speaking each other's language and being able to communicate with each other so we know that we, that each other is getting what we're trying to say, there's going to be a language barrier. Well, and it's interesting you say that because I was thinking back to meetings that I've had over the years, you know, and I was thinking about like, you know, the females that ran the meetings and the males who ran the meetings and, you know, and it kind of goes both ways. It's like, you know, if a man runs a meeting with a bunch of women, a lot of times he's going to do it in a way that's anecdotal. It's storytelling. There's a lot of details. There might be emotion involved in it, you know, and then if you look at, you know, the, the male dominated population, that would drive most of them bloody bananas. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, 
I think I learned at like 18, you know, working with Marines to like get to the point, like, what do they say? Keep it simple, yeah. stupid, you know, shut up and whatever. And it was not in my nature because I'm a big old blabber mouth. You know what I mean? I get <laughs> talk on the radio all day long, but I had to learn that skill because I was literally driving, you know, people batty. Mm hmm. I say to the girls all the time when they're doing this and they're ruminating and I feel like they're going around and around and around. I'm like, get to the bullseye. And I will say that as a woman, I'm like, go right to the bullseye. You don't have to give me all these erroneous details. Like, think about what you want to say and your main point. Go right for that bullseye um, because that is what you will have to do when you are in a leadership role because, unfortunately, most of, um, you know, C-level positions are still run by men or ha are possessed by men and politically and we are a male-dominated culture. We're still wedded to those archaic stereotypes. It is, you know, more that the male is the norm. But we should be able to, um, you know, get our point across very clearly and articulate our message really clearly so we don't lose our audience. Well, and I think it's a twofold thing on there because, you know, like my – the guy I date is a, you know, military executive and – or military – retired military now executive. And he always says, elevator pitch, honey. <laughs> elevator pitch. You know, give, give it to me in like yeah, you know, yeah. seconds. Elevator pitch. And the funny thing is, is, you know, I've become better. Like I, I was very good strategically communicating the point in the business world. I just didn't, you know, master it in my personal life clearly. Um but the funny thing is, is that when you learn to kind of do the man speak, or you called it like gender bilingual, like how to speak man, um, mm -hmm. it actually does work really well in a lot of business environments. Because one of the things I have found that the way women communicate is through, you know, stories and emotions and feelings and all these things. And then I can walk away from a meeting going, that was really great. But what was the point? You know, yeah, exactly. I focus on all these other things. Like I focus on, oh, she was so sad or, oh, her poor child, you know, realized uh -huh. <laughs> the meeting was about time management. Woo, blew that one. Yeah. Um, but I think yeah, there's and something also, about, you know, women, do, there's a book that I call Fearless Communication in my uh, chapter, Fearless Communication in my book. And it is that women do have a communication pattern that does need to be tweaked. So they put a lot of fillers like, um, or like. Or they will, you know, they will speak a statement and then put a question mark on it because they want to get consensus. So sometimes that could be perceived as that, so are you saying that or you're asking me? And if you're asking me, why do you not feel confident to just say it? You don't need to get, you know, you don't need to get consensus. If you feel something or if you think something, you are allowed to put that out there without going and or, so what do you guys think? Uh, that's a, that's also something a phrase that women put on their the end of their sentences. What do you think? Instead of just stating what you want to say and leaving it there, just let it hang there. And believe me, you will get a reaction. You don't have to ask what do you think because that looks like you're you're not so sure. Yeah, but that's also part of our gender people pleasing. You know, most of us, at least I know, I was raised in a, you know, a, a good Catholic girl household on the Upper East Coast, you know, where you, you know, you don't, you don't have strong opinions. You don't, you know, you don't make these definitive statements. And, you know, it's something that I think a lot of women have to learn, you know, is socially, what might be socially unacceptable growing up is actually, you know, kind of required in certain circumstances. And, you know, it's funny you, you talk about that, like the, um, or hmm, or whatever, because one of the things that struck me, Stacy, is, um, uh, are we going to commercial break? Gosh, I think I lost oh. time here. Um, I can't tell. I've got some cues coming through, but I'm going to take us to the end of the show. We're going to bring Stacy back. We're going to talk about uh, more interesting things. I think I could talk to her forever. We're so glad you joined us for Powered Up with Beck and Franklin. Sandra Beck, Los Angeles-based single mother and technology company owner, knows what it's like to be fit, funny, and fantastic in your 40s. Linda Franklin, a New Yorker with a successful